welcome to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's program. Before we get into that, let me remind you that uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, even suggestions for programs, send your emails to sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. Sunday Night Prime at EWTN.com. You know, a lot of people wonder, where does the church get its support for the, you know, the priests and ministers of the church? Uh, where does it get the support for the parishes and so on? And we'll see that these come from the offerings of people. And in the Old Testament, we already find that God had set up an arrangement so that those who ministered to him and the uh, religious services for the Jewish people would have some support. And of course, that carries through in the New Testament, we'll see. Okay, I think you're going to find this a very interesting program. Okay, it's entitled, What Are, th uh, what are Tithes? What Are Tithes? Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We get it from a, um, a letter, an unusual letter here, from a young lady from... Tanzania, or I should say a young Catholic, I don't know her age, but she writes this. Praise our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, Father. My name is Anna from Tanzania. I am a new Catholic. Father, I have this really disturbing question about tithes. Why? Because I think the church is not using it to help the right people. God forgive me, but that's how I feel. So, my question is, is it okay for me to use my tithes to help people who really, really, really need it? Am I disobeying God? Please tell me the truth. God bless you. And her name is Kadasa, Katasha. Katasha. Katasha, I'm sorry. Katasha. Well, Katasha, I will try to tell you the truth as well as I can communicate it to you. I see your question is very sincere. I see the, uh, 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 a kind of dilemma of your conscience. You want to be supporting the church, uh, but at the same time you think maybe uh, what tithe you give could be better used in a different way for uh, church needs. Well. Let's first of all go through what is a tithe. That's our title here for our program today. What's a tithe? Well, the, the word itself means a tenth, a tenth part of something, 10%. Okay, you take um, a, a pizza pie and you cut it up into 10 pieces. You take one, 10 equal pieces, and you've got a tenth of that pie. Okay, um, so a tenth of anything would be a tithe. But when it comes to biblical usage, okay, what a tithe refers to is um, a person who owns land or perhaps has livestock that they own, okay, um, they would give 10% of their uh, produce from the lands or even the livestock and give it as an offering to the clergy for their support, okay. And um, that would be used also for religious and charitable purposes. That would be a tithe. So a person would get, give 10% of their uh, produce, maybe the garden, if they owned a vineyard or they owned an orchard or something like that. And then they would give 10% of that or the crops they grow. And uh, they would present that, uh, in the, we'll see in the Old Testament, to the temple. And... Um, and then later on, we'll see in the New Testament how the local parish priest is supported, uh, generally not by all these things, unless you're in a very, um, maybe a country, a third world country as a missionary. I remember uh, when I was Capuchin and some of our friars who were working in Zambia said that people would come and they would offer some of their, you know, a chicken or something like that as a part of the... Uh, offertory procession. Now that must have been an interesting offertory procession, don't you think? <laughs> Bringing up a live chicken or, uh, you know, some of the crops that they would bring and so on. Um, but let's go 
let's go back into the Old Testament and see where we can find, you know, how did this idea of the tithes come about? Where is it first mentioned? Well, it appears to be an ancient custom because we'll see an example in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20. And this involves Abraham, whose name at the time was Abram. He, God had not changed his name yet. And uh, let me read how he gave a tithe. Okay, that's, <clears throat> that's uh, Genesis uh, 14, 18 to 20. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> See, Abraham had, uh, had liberated or freed his uh, nephew Lot. Lot had been captured by these kings, and um, Abra Abraham went after them and defeated them. And as he was coming back, he came across Melchizedek. And let me read to you 18 to 20 here, okay? Um, when Abram returned from his victory, he met Melchizedek, king of Salem, who brought out bread and wine. And being a priest of God Most High, he blessed Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your foes into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, uh, that's a very interesting uh, little episode there. Uh, Melchizedek comes, and remember, Melchizedek is kind of a priest with a certain awe or mystery about him. For example, we don't know his origin. We don't know where we, he is. He's said to be the king of Salem, but we don't know where he came from. We don't know when he died. So he has no beginning, no end, so to speak. And that's why Scripture you know, in the, uh, in the New Testament, uh, we'll talk about him in the letter to the Hebrews as the eternal symbol of the eternal priest, no beginning, no end. And, and remember, Jesus was a priest in the line of Melchizedek. Hmm? And so um, uh, Melchizedek comes out. He's a priest of, the, of God Most High. He blesses Abram, which means... He was of greater dignity than Abram because the, the greater always blessed the lesser. So Abraham, who's the father of all believers, he's blessed by this priest Melchizedek. And then in turn, Abram, you know, is moved to give him a tenth of everything. There's the tithe. Now, no explanation is given as to why, perhaps in gratitude to Melchizedek for giving him such a beautiful blessing. Okay, but we see that Abraham uh, felt under obligation to give a tenth of his uh, possessions to, to Melchizedek, the priest of God Most High. We find another reference to a tithe, and this one involves Jacob, the, uh, the grandson of Abraham. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Now, Jacob was going to make a, a journey and he prayed to God and made him a promise that he wanted God's protection for safety in his journey and going and coming. And this is found in Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 to 22. And here's what we read. Jacob then made this vow. If God remains with me to protect me on this journey I am making and to give me enough bread to eat and clothing to wear, and I come back safe to my father's house, the Lord shall be my God. This, this stone that I have set up as a memorial stone shall be God's abode. Of everything you give me, I will faithfully return a tenth part to you. So he's making a vow promising to give a tithe. Okay, again, mysteriously, but he's... Uh, doing that in response to the favor of God blessing him, protecting him on his journey, and, um, uh, you know, letting him go forth unharmed and come back unharmed, and he promises this uh, tenth part, this tithe. 
Okay, so we see two early references there already to tithing in the Old Testament. Okay, um, now later on, uh, after God revealed the law to, to the Jewish people through Moses, okay, tithes became obligatory. All right, and probably they looked to their great patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who were uh, already offering tithes. And so God made that part of the responsibility of his people through his law. The Jews had to offer to God a tenth part of the produce of the fields, again, their crops, uh, of the fruits from their trees and so on, as well as to offer the firstborn of their oxen and the firstborn of their sheep. Okay, so this was considered then a tithe, and the Jewish people were required to pay, pay that. Okay, now, uh, although these uh, tithes were made to God, they were offered to God, he transferred them to his sacred ministers, which we read about in the book of Numbers, chapter 18, verse 21. And God says this, To the Levites, however, I hereby assign all tithes in Israel as, well as their heritage in recompense for the service they perform in the meeting tent. Okay, let me explain that. This is to the Levites. Okay, remember, Jacob had 12 sons, and from those sons come the 12 tribes of Israel, at least um, with a little bit of changing around here. Let me explain that. See, the sons of Jacob were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, Gad, Asher, Dan, Naphtali, Benjamin, and Joseph. Now, Joseph had two sons. They were Ephraim, and Manasseh, okay? Now, Joseph generally is not considered among the tribes. So if you have 12 and you take him out, that's 11, but he had two sons, that would be 13, okay? But when the Jewish people settled in the Holy Land, one of those other tribes, the tribe of Levi, did not receive its own portion of land. All the other 12 tribes, including again, as I said, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were sons of, of Joseph. Remember, Joseph, you know, was third in line there in Egypt. Huh? And his family had come down to Egypt, his father and his brothers. And so all the other tribes did receive a portion of the land. But the Levites did not. Why? Because they had to focus on carrying out the religious services for the Jewish people throughout the Holy Land, especially at the Temple in Jerusalem, when that developed later on. So without land of their own, how were they to support themselves? How were they to eat? How, where were they going to get, you know, the things that they needed to live on? Well, that's where the tithe comes in, see? So God uh, commanded his people that they had to give one-tenth of their crops and, and so on, fruit and, as we heard, and livestock and sheep, the firstborn of each uh, to the Levites, okay? They would actually give them to God, but God in turn, you know, as we heard from the book of Numbers, transferred to the Levites all that was given as a tithe. And so that's how the, the sacred ministers, you might call them, the, of the Old Testament, uh, were supported. They were supported by the generous donations, the tithes of all the people in the, the various tribes of, uh, of Israel. Okay, so that's very, very important. And of course, that will set the precedent later on um, for the New Testament, which we will see. See, and uh, it also should point out that even the Jewish kings and pagan kings would demand tithes of their people. Um, that's how the king would be supported and support his government and, and so on from the people, you know, being uh, generous to, to give one tenth of their. Um, their, you might call it income, uh, in terms of produce and in terms of the, the uh, livestock that they had. So that was a very important thing, but it sets the stage 
as we will see now, we're going to take a little break right now, for the New Testament and how this carried on in a certain sense in the New Testament. Don't go away. We'll be right back. We've got some really interesting things to share. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, which is entitled, What is a Tithe? Okay, we've been talking about the tithe as a tenth part of the offering. The people, uh, beginning the Old Testament, gave uh, to their sacred ministers of the tribe of Levi, uh, the high priest and all the, the priestly uh, clan, and also to all the Levites who were assistants Sometimes they compare them to the priests and the deacons. Um, but the, uh, the Levites were supported by these tithes of uh, food, produce from the land, fruits, and so on, and even the firstborn of the oxen and the sheep. Now, what about in the New Testament? Well, we really don't find any command to be tithing directly in the New Testament. We find St. Paul kind of gives us uh, a, um, a good directive here. Let's look at that. This is in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verses 13 and 14. Okay, Here's what St. Paul says. Do you not know that those who perform the temple services eat what belongs to the temple, and those who minister at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. Hmm? Oh, very important instruction there from St. Paul because he's saying that just like the Levites, you know, lived from the offerings made by the people, that those tithes, uh, because they were being supported in their work of carrying out the religious services and uh, instructing the people and so on. So in the New Testament, the same is true. Um, and, you know, isn't it true that, you know, as priests, uh, our priests and uh, our teachers and so on uh, who preach the gospel and so on are supported by that work of, uh, you know, their priestly, uh, let's say, sacramental service, mission, mass, confessions and so on, and also by preaching. And that's very, very important. So let's see if we can see a little bit more here what St. Paul is talking about. See, some kind of income or support for the sacred ministers uh, had to be present. At first, this was uh, supplied by the spontaneous offerings of the faithful. Okay? But as time went on and the church expanded and there were various... Um, institutions that arose, it became necessary to make laws to ensure the proper and, um, uh, the proper and, and permanent support of the clergy. Now, the payment of tithes was adapted from the Old Testament at a certain time. Uh, first reference we find to um, church uh, writers talking about this was in a letter of bishops at the at Tours in, in France in the year 567. They made reference to that, that uh, tithing, they said, was a divine ordinance or command. And so it obliged in conscience. Now, that's a, a very, um, very, very important thing to realize. In other words, we do have an obligation to support those who uh, work for the Lord and in turn are working for us to lead us in, you know, first of all, teaching, uh, sanctifying, the three roles that we have, teaching, sanctifying, and reigning, or, you know, our works of charity and uh, guidance that uh, ca are carried out by the clergy, and especially with the bishops, priests, deacons with them, and so on, okay? So there is an obligation. If the, if the sacred ministers are going to do the work of the Lord, they need some means of support, okay? Now, in time, 
The payment of tithes was even made obligatory uh, by church rules, you know, in almost all the countries in what was known as Christendom. That view, especially of Europe, where the countries were governed by accepted Christian norms and morality, um, where it was almost a kind of a common bond to have a faith in Christ. So many of those countries did put out laws that obliged the paying of tithes, okay? And the, church, the church then looked on this payment as a divine law, okay? Because they, the idea of tithes was not instituted by men. It was instituted by, by God himself, okay? Various countries, even the civil laws, okay? Civil laws were passed to enforce the paying of tithes. One author refers to Charlemagne and some of his laws in English law that, that was true. They distinguished three kinds of tithes. Um, one, the what they call predial, pre almost looks it reads like predial, predial tithes. These were derived from the annual crops and the harvest, okay? And this was the great tithe. In other words, most of what was given was given from the produce of the land. Okay, and so uh, this was very important, again, to support the priests and um, the other uh, ministers who were carrying out, you know, the work of sanctification and teaching among the people of God. Then there were the mixed tithes. These arose from the things that are nourished by the land. Here, for example, cattle. Remember we said that they had to give, in the Old Testament, they had to give the firstborn of the cattle and the firstborn of the sheep. Also milk cheese, wool. Um, this was a smaller tithe, uh, uh, but it was, uh, of, of course, very important, as you can imagine, things like milk and cheese, wool, how very important they would be. Huh? And then finally, personal tithes, which would be uh, things that would result from a person's trade or their occupation. Um, and, uh, and so, again, this was one of the smaller offerings but perhaps someone was a carpenter, you know, made some furniture, that wooden furniture that could be used by people or whatever it was. See, now at first these tithes were received by the bishop. But again, as the church expanded away from the main city where the bishop was, he couldn't be present at all of the, uh, let's say, masses where the offertory processions would, he would be receiving a lot of this, okay? Uh, later, that right to receive this was passed on to the parish priests. And that's what we have today, basically, in the offertory procession. Uh, you know, when um, instead of uh, people bringing in animals or uh, the produce in a bushel basket or something, um, they would give their donation in money. But they, there were abuses, unfortunately, because, see, some of the church authorities... They were giving the right to receive tithes to princes and nobles who, in exchange for their protection, okay, or to get some kind of major favor from the, the uh, king or the prince, you know. And so um, this led to, you know, uh, lay people becoming involved in the, um, uh, the, the distribution, uh, possession and distribution of the goods that were being offered, really, for the support of the clergy and the local church. So there was a council, the Third Council of the Lateran, which uh, forbade uh, lay people receiving these tithes, okay, without the consent of the Pope. That's how bad it got. And that was a, it's 1179 was when the Third Council of the Lateran was held. That was a kind of very... Um, difficult period in the church's history internally. There were a lot of needs of reform uh, for, you know, especially lay investiture, which meant that uh, kings and uh, princes were uh, taking on to themselves the right to appoint bishops and, uh, you know, clergy and have authority over church things. There was no separation of church and state at that point. And, and that's where some of the difficulties it led to. One interesting tithe that was set up by Pope Gregory VIII, um, he established what was called a Saladin 
tithes, okay? And this was a tithe that had to be paid by those people who did not take part personally in the Crusades by going to the Holy Land and fighting to liberate, you know, the uh, holy places there in the Holy Land. So it was called the Saladin Tithe, all right? And that was po by Pope Gregory VIII. Today, in most countries um, where there might exist a tithe, such as in Austria, Germany, some parts of England, um, the tithe has been basically changed to a rent charge. In other words, for the use of the church and uh, for, um, you know, other, uh, other reasons that uh, the, the um, church would require that. I, I know uh, we have one of our brothers who's working in Germany, and he said that uh, even the salaries of the priests there are paid through the state. So... Um, this, is, um, this would be one way in which the state would have some influence there. Not always the best thing. As I said, there were excesses of um, lay investiture uh, and uh, lay people, often rulers, and interfering really in church matters. That can be very difficult. Um, now, today, in most English-speaking countries, you know, in general, um, Catholic clergy don't receive tithes, okay? Other means have been adopted uh, to support the clergy and the mission of the church um, to support all of our institutions. For example, uh, the obvious thing would be the weekly Sunday collection at the masses. That's very important. Now, this goes back to the question that uh, uh, her name, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly, um, Katasha. Katasha had asked about, you know, can I use my tithes to, um, you know, for other purposes than, let's say, what the tithe was being asked for. In other words, the offerings there, okay? Apparently in her country, in uh, Tanzania, they may still be uh, using the form of tithe, okay? Um, it's very important, though, that we support the local parish, we have to do something with them. I'll talk a little bit more about at the end when I kind of go through some questions about this, how we can uh, find our way to a balance through these, uh, these different um, needs that we have. The church has needs of support in so many different ways. Um, but the weekly Sunday collection is certainly one way where the church um, seeks to obtain the support it needs paying for the priest for his living and living quarters and food and, and so on, uh, at the same time to have some kind of income um, for his expenses, personal and so on. Uh, but there's also special collections that we make, right? So we support other parts of the life of the church so that we have the mission collection every year. We have collections for the seminary, uh, for Catholic education, these are needs that the church would have, and it's through the generosity of the people of God that uh, we can support this work, okay? It's not done in the formal sense of a, you know, you must give a, whole, a, a tithe of your income, your annual income, but the church asks us to be as generous as we can. You know, at the end of every program, I uh, generally would, will ask you know, uh, carried in the United States for the people in the United States to be generous in supporting um, uh, the programs here on EWTN. So that's important. So the law of, of tithes, though, however, um, many theologians still say it is, um, cannot be done away with completely, um, even though it's not in use at this time. But it's recognized that they, there is almost a, a natural or divine law indicating the need to support those who, uh, the, the church and, and her needs through her ministers, the priests and, uh, and other, others who serve, you know, in liturgy and in education and the like. So it's very important, but it, it, it is still recognized as something of divine law. Why? Because a sense of justice would demand this, wouldn't it? You know, if the priests in the 
teachers, the evangelists, and all those who do these kind of works, if they're doing them for the good of the church, for the lives of our Catholic people, you know, um, giving services as well, uh, you know, like for example, in the area of health and uh, education um, and uh, other needs that people have, food distribution and the like, um, it's almost a sense of justice that we have to support them. And that's what the idea of uh, tithes is all about. Now we're going to take another break right now, but when we come back, I've got some questions I'd like to go through on this question of tithes, and uh, we'll see how far we can go in, in answering them and trying to help uh, Katasha with her question. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, which is entitled, What is a Tithe? We come to some questions now. We've been talking about tithes, and we saw it in the Mosaic Law, in the Old Testament, even the tithes that uh, the patriarchs Abraham and Jacob offered to God. Uh, we saw St. Paul's teaching in the New Testament. Those who uh, serve at the altar have a right to be supported by the altar. Those who preach the Word of God, have a right to be supported by their preaching. Uh, so let's go into some questions here then. How then, uh, we said that tithes are not there, uh, you know, in the, um, in the mostly English-speaking countries. So then what is the norm? If we're not using the norm of tithe, what is our norm, norm to um, Express how we should support the church, okay? Well, it's very simple. It's one of the, what we call the precepts of the church. It's found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2043, 2043. It's under the fifth precept. It says, you shall help to provide for the needs of the church. And this means that the faithful are obliged to assist with the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. See, they have the a duty of providing for the material needs of the church, again, according to one's abilities. And that's in the found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, number 2043. Uh, remember, this is the precepts of the church. Uh, these are rules, for example, um, that we have to attend Mass on Sunday and the Holy Days of Obligation, um, rest from servile labor. We have to confess our sins at least once a year. Uh, that is also a precept of the Church. Uh, you shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season now, uh, at least once during the year. And finally, to observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the Church as well as the one we just saw, this fifth precept, you, you shall help to provide for the needs of the church, okay? By, um, again, the faithful trying to assist, you know, uh, according to their ability, according to their means. And so that becomes the norm that uh, we uh, would be following, okay? And um, you might say, well, how much should we give? Well, I, I think, and this might help to, uh, you know, K Katasha, for her question, um, you know, can I give my tithes to, um, to people that I feel really, really, really need them, okay? Am I disobeying God? Well, I would say, Katasha, to kind of balance this question for your conscience, I would say you should give something to the support of your parish, your priest there, the church, because after all, they do minister um, the sacraments to you. The priest has to be supported. Imagine if you didn't have a priest, there wouldn't be any Eucharist. 
There wouldn't be any confessions. There wouldn't be any maybe preaching. And, uh, so that, I think, you should give some, a certain amount of that, a sufficient amount to, of your donation that you give, whatever do, money you're intending to give as a donation. So a sufficient amount for that. However, you know, there can be uh, other things that you give to. And you may have some very dear um, causes, needs that you are aware of. The people, as you said, that really, really, really need it. Okay. Uh, in that case, you should give something of what you are going to set aside for your donations. Here's what St. Paul said about that. Okay, this is from... 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 6 and following. Remember, he was taking up a collection for the poor. And um, he said this to them, to encourage them to be as generous as they could. Consider this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each time do as already determined, without sadness or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Moreover, God is able to make every grace abundant for you, so that in all things, always uh, having all you need, you may have an abundance for every good work. Okay, so what he's saying here is if you're only going to give a little bit, that's what you're going to get back as your reward. So if you're going to be rather miserly or very limited, I'm going to give very, very little. You're going to get very little reward back. Okay, but he says if you sow bountifully, in other words, scatter the seeds all over, you're going to have a great harvest. So God will reward you according to your generosity. Okay. So he said, each must do as already determined. The old translation put it very nicely, give what you decide in your heart. I like that. Give what you decide in your heart. You have to make a decision. What am I going to give? Okay, give that. Okay, because they were concerned about, you know, if I give everything, I'm going to be poor. And he said, no, give what you decide in your heart. But when you give it, you know, give it cheerfully, huh? Don't give it with sadness, reluctance. Who likes a, a giver like that, huh? You know, somebody that has a big, long face because they got to give you something, huh? Like, you, you, you know, you think they're making <laughs> the ultimate sacrifice of their life, huh? Um, but we should not be sad in, in our giving. We should not do it by compulsion. <clears throat> We're not forced God doesn't want to force us. Hmm? We have to be able to do it cheerfully. And St. Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Don't we too? Don't we love when people, they give and they're, they're very cheerful about it and they help us and there's a goodness that comes from that. And that's the way you want to be in your giving, all right? Giving as generously as you can and, and sometimes, let's face it, is going to be a sacrifice. Is something that we have to give up. At, at this point in, in the Second Corinthians, St. Paul is talking about a big collection that he's gathering for the poor, especially in the Holy Land there. Um, <clears throat> and um, he, uh, he's asking the people to be as generous as they can. Not that, not that they should uh, impoverish themselves. Again, that we don't want. But to give what they, they decide in their heart. And uh, so finding a balance between giving what you give to support of your local parish and church there um, to the needs of the diocese, but there may be something left over that you want to also give to a charity, you know, uh, especially uh, you might, so your question, Katasha, uh, seems to express a concern, uh, are all of these the best uh, ones to give to are they um, what we the question are they really is the money really going to the people who need it and so on well you have to check into that as best you can and um, and then make your offering from your heart cheerfully that's important um, 
uh, you know, um, imagine if there were married clergy hmm, and uh, to support uh, not only the, the, the ministers, but their wives and families, you know. Um, one of the great blessings of uh, celibacy, you know, because it, otherwise you end up with a kind of part-time clergy, you know, because many of them have to go out and get a job to support their families if they didn't have enough through what comes in for the parish. So that also enters into that question of supporting the parish. You know, when I, uh, when I was a young brother and I began my studies in theology, uh, they used to have what they called the minor orders. Uh, some of them are now what we call um, ministries in the church. For example, lector and um, uh, acolyte. To lector would be the reading, one who reads, for example, liturgy, acolyte, one who serves. But um, the, there was also two others which now are no, no longer given, the porter, that was just uh, abolished, and then exorcist, you know, where uh, kind of a certain ritual to have a, um, a call to that ministry, you know, to do the work of exorcism. I wonder if someday they may restore that because with, with the spread of the demonic in the world today, we could certainly use the power of the, the uh, make it a ministry of exorcism, but that has to be the decision of the church. Um, but um, before you got those four minor orders, they were called, you, were, you received your tonsure, okay? The bishop would cut your hair in five places. Now, you might think I lost all my hair at that point. I did not. No. I gradually have lost it over the years. But he would cut your hair in five parts, like almost like a cross. And, um, and when you were tonsured, at that time, it was like a sign of entering to the clergy. In fact, you know, over the centuries, especially in the Middle Ages, the clergy had a tonsure, which was like about the size of a, what would be a silver dollar today, where there was just a little bald spot, okay? And that was called the clerical tonsure. And perhaps you've seen statues or paintings of St. Francis and St. Anthony with just a little crown of hair, okay? That was the religious tonsure. And um, I, I remember going into a grammar school. I was a vocation director years ago, and uh, I gave a talk to all the youngsters from the second grade to the eighth grade. And when I got done, you know, I asked, does anybody have any questions? Well, this little boy, who was probably a second grader, goes way, way up front, and he jumps out of his seat and he's waving his hand with excitement. And you know the question's going to be as exciting as the boy is exciting, you know. And so I said to him, yes, what's your question? He said, how come all the Franciscans are bald? Well, I guess he saw my head and figured, you know. But I couldn't figure out what he was trying to get at until after the whole program was over, I went into his church and there was the statue of St. Anthony with that little crown of hair. That was called the corona, and that was a uh, that was worn by the the uh, the religious. That was the religious crown. But the service of a tonsure, the cutting of the hair, again was a sign of becoming part of the clergy. All right, and that gave the person in the clerical state a right to certain what they call benefices. For example, a church might have attached to it. A, um, it may have an orchard or a vineyard, and so from the fruit that's grown there, and you know, they could sell that and help to support the church. So that was kind of like a benefice that they had, all kinds of benefices. Um, and that was given to the clergy, also became a, a way of supporting the clergy. Well, we have time to go on to another very interesting uh, question. Uh, I received this, and it's uh, uh, from a, a woman named Christine. She writes, Dear Father Andrew, peace of the Lord. Thank you for all you do for the good Lord in the church. Okay. Would you please consider answering the following questions during the EWTN Prime pr program? Thank you for your consideration. Now, these are interesting questions. Number one, I do not have an 
email, so I thought it would, I would mail these questions to you. When will St. John Paul II be formally declared by the church St. John Paul II the Great? Well, now that's an interesting question, Christine. Um, I know people are already calling him John Paul the Great. Uh, I do myself from time to time refer to him as Pope John, Pope St. John Paul the Great because he was a great pope. Um, the tremendous um, leadership he gave at a very crucial time in the church's history. And, uh, you know, remember he was very instrumental in helping to bring down communism, you know, in uh, Russia and in Eastern Europe and all those countries that were part of the Soviet Union. He was instrumental through his stirring up, you know, nationalism in his native country of Poland. And so he became a figure of great, as I could see it, strength and courage. So uh, I think he's had a remarkable impact on the church. And um, also, too, you know, my special love for Our Lady of Fatima, I, I believe he will be the Fatima Pope because uh, he's the one who did the consecration that had long been, you know, not accomplished. You know, when Our Lady requested it way back in 1929, and it was only after his, the attempt on his life when he was shot and wounded seriously, almost died, remember? He used to say, it's not so much the Blessed Mother saved me from death, it's um, she gave me back my life. And, uh, and so he, um, uh, you know, he, he made that consecration, which is bringing peace to the world. Let me move on because there's a couple more questions here. When will St. John Paul II be declared a doctor of the church? Well, uh, he's certainly a prime candidate, God willing, to receive that title. You know, I mean, just think. I, I referred back to my book here on Fatima for today because I had a whole chapter on him to point out how significant he was. And that, let me just read to you a part of that. This is pay, from page 182 in my book, Fatima for Today. Okay, His talent for writing helped him produce 14 encyclicals, 14 apostolic exhortations, 11 apostolic constitutions, 45 apostolic letters, and other writings like sermons. It has been said that it will take the Catholic Church 75 years to absorb, absorb all that he taught us. He also oversaw a needed revision of canon law and the universal catechism that were called for by the Second Vatican Council. He wrote his material on the theology of the body, which is influencing us now, and something on uh, pro-life, which influenced Pope, uh, Pope Paul VI and his encyclical on Humani Vitae. Now, let me go on to two more questions here, okay? When will the cause for canonization for Father Benedict Rochelle be opened? Can the five-year wait period be waived? Well, as you know, Father died last year, and this is, we're in uh, 2015. He died in 2014. Uh, you have to wait five years to open the cause of canonization. There have been, to my knowledge, only two exceptions to that in very recent times. One was Pope St. John Paul II, and the other was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And uh, they were giants in the faith, and I think because there would have been a very uh, uh, popular desire for the canonization of these two great individuals, that that's probably why the Holy Father decided to waive the uh, wait, you know, for five years. Um, I guess five years allows um, the opportunity for a prayerfulness to pray to this person, you know. Just two things before you can open a cause you have to show. You have to show, first of all, that the person who you want to proposed for canonization has a, uh, first one, enjoys a reputation for holiness. Did the people consider this person holy, saintly? Okay. And secondly, uh, since the death of that person, 
Have there been many favors, blessings, possibly even healings and cures that have occurred through the intercession of that person? So these are two things that have to be proven before a cause can even be opened. So um, I would think, all things being equal, he, Father would probably go the five-year limit, okay? He probably will not open before that, but you never know. I don't know if Pope Francis knew of him. Um, I would hope he did, but we don't know. But here's another question. Will Father Benedict Rochelle be declared a doctor of the church? Well, I, I think he certainly... Um, had, you know, some very outstanding gifts that he presented to the church. Now, we looked at Pope John Paul II as a possible doctor of the church. Here's what are qualifications to be a doctor of the church. You know, first of all, you need holiness, so you have to be canonized. There has to be uh, an outstanding learning, some contribution, okay? Orthodoxy, that there was no errors being taught, and there has to be a declaration by the church. And I think both uh, Pope John Paul II, certainly, without doubt, and even Father Benedict would qualify for that. Well, we've come to the end of this program. I hope it's been enjoyable and informative for you. So let us be generous givers, you know, as both Pope John Paul and uh, Father Benedict have been. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant to us the grace of generous love for you who have been so generous in blessing us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. I bless all of you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God love you now. Well, now we come to that part in the program where we ask your generosity, as we've been talking about tithes in this program today, um, to help support the wonderful work and mission of EWTN, the Eternal Word Television Network. Uh, how many people this network reaches, we don't even know for sure. Um, you know, sometimes a person may be channel surfing and you never know, come across a program on EW10 that it can change your life. I heard about someone that that happened to recently. He had to even, he was in a bad situation, he led to a great conversion. So please help to support the work of EWTN. Be as generous as you can. Be a cheerful giver, okay? And God will reward you too. Remember, if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So God love you, and uh, we'll look forward to being with you again.